Welcome everyone to today's presentation entitled uh, The Tragic Death of Garrick Phillips, A Cry for Justice. Uh, this is going to be a two-part presentation and today I'm going to be starting off with part one. My name is Dr. Silkman and I'm from the Foul Play team. Welcome. The question I'm going to be asking today is who killed 12-year-old Garrick Phillips. Now, I didn't know much about this case until I saw the two-part um, crime documentary on HBO entitled Who Killed Garrick Phillips? It was produced and directed by Liz Garbus. Uh, and here is unfortunately the uh, victim, Garrick Phillips. It really is a human tragedy on so many levels. And what I want to do in this presentation is demonstrate how did this crime unfold in real time. So we need to ask the question, when and where did the murder of Garrett Phillips take place? The crime took place on Monday, October the 24th, 2011 in Potsdam, which is upstate New York. The crime specifically took place at 100 Market Street, North Country, Manor Apartments. It occurred on the second floor apartment, apartment 4D. So just a little bit about Potsdam. Potsdam is in St. Lawrence County, upstate New York. And if you have a look over here on the map, Potsdam is pretty close to the Canadian border. It's in St. Lawrence County. Now, in 2010, um, the racial makeup of the village was determined to be 91.6% of the population being white, 2.5% of the population being black or African American. At that time that the census was uh, done, there were 9,428 people living there. Uh, also in Potsdam, there are four universities, and this provided a diverse culture, especially amongst the students, as can be seen here. Now, I want to introduce to you two very important ear witnesses, and these two are the neighbours to the second floor apartment 4D. We have Marisa Vogel and Sean Hall. Now, we had Tandy Cyrus, Garrick Phillips, and his younger half-brother, Aaron Collins, had lived in apartment 4D. The family had lived there since mid-August 2011. Uh, this was an ideal uh, apartment to be in because it was actually close to Potsdam Public School Complex. Now, there were also another set of neighbours which were very important in this narrative. And these were the neighbours that lived behind the complex. Now, I want you to pay close attention to this particular window that's been outlined in red. And Shannon Harris uh, and her boyfriend, uh, Andrew, uh, lived behind the apartment complex with his family. So you can actually see the apartment complex here denoted by a red arrow. So you had um, the other two neighbors who were next door neighbors who lived in the complex and you also had neighbors who lived behind the complex. So let's start the narrative and this is occurring in real time. So Marisa Vogel had arrived home at 4.20 p.m. She had watched TV with Sean uh, in their bedroom at 5 p.m. Now, Shannon and Andrew, they were changing a car tire at the back of the apartment complex at 5 p.m. Now, Shannon had heard multiple noises and kept looking up at this particular window but she could not see anything. 
Andrew at the time was underneath the car with a jack because they were changing a tire. Now, let's have a look at both Marisa Vogel and Sean Hall. Both Marisa and Sean heard running and then a crash, and there was silence after the crash. They heard a moan for help, and it sounded like oh or no. Uh, both of them said that it was definitely coming from a child's voice. It, sand, it sounded scared, and they heard the word help. All of this commotion was coming from apartment 4D. So, Marisa was very concerned with what she heard. So Marisa went out of her apartment and knocked on the door to apartment 4D. She heard a noise coming from behind the door and she heard a click, which sounded exactly like a lock clicking. So Marisa Vogel is obviously concerned with what she heard. So at 5.08, she calls the uh, police dispatcher in the Potsdam Police Department. Now remember, all calls are time stamped. So Marisa Vogel calls the police dispatcher at 5.08 p.m. Now, Officer Wentworth, he responds to the call out. He arrives at the apartment at 5.14 p.m. and he listens at the door. He doesn't hear any noise. Then he knocks and he hears a sound like someone starting to walk around. Now note, this is six minutes have transpired uh, since Marisa had called the dispatcher. Now the big question, and this is something that's going to haunt Officer Wentworth for many, many years, is who does Officer Wentworth actually hear walking around the apartment for D. The police dispatcher at 521 calls Rick Jumis. Uh, Rick Jumis is the actual landlord. So Officer Wentworth waits at the door. He's waiting for the landlord to arrive in order to gain entry into the apartment. At 524, uh, Officer Wentworth knocks on the door with his patrol stick and he calls for the occupant of the uh, unit of the apartment to open up. This is at 524. And Officer Wentworth says that he hears noises that sound like movement from inside the apartment. At 5.33 p.m., the landlord, Rick Jumis, arrives and he opens the door to the apartment. It's obvious that Rick Jumis has a spare key in order to open up the apartment. When the uh, officer and Rick Jumis enter into the uh, apartment, they find Garrett Phillips to be in an unresponsive state and he's laying on the floor uh, in his mother's bedroom. And you can see here, because these are all recorded, uh, the officer says, I'm going to start CPR. Now, let's have a look at these particular time events because they're very, very crucial. Now, this is Monday, October the 24th, 2011. John Jones name was mentioned and this is very significant. And you'll see why in a second. So they're in the apartment now and uh, Officer Wentworth says, unresponsive, male, probably 10 years old, no pulse, not breathing. That's about really all we got. They discover, and the officer says, the mother is Tandy Cyrus. Mark Wentworth at 5.51 p.m. rings up the police dispatcher, and they're having a conversation of what they're seeing in apartment 4D. The police dispatcher makes the comment, isn't she John Jones' ex-girlfriend? At 5.55 p.m., the police dispatcher phones Ed Tischler. He's the chief 
of Potsdam Police Department. And the police dispatcher makes the comment, I think it's John Jones' old girlfriend. And this is John Jones. Now, John Jones happens to be a sheriff's deputy and is also the ex-boyfriend of Tandy Cyrus. At 6 p.m., Nancy Rutledge, who's the supervisor at the Canton Potsdam Hospital, phones the police dispatcher. Now remember, at this stage, Garrett Phillips has been rushed to the hospital. And this is John Jones, as I stated before, is a sheriff's deputy and is the ex-boyfriend of Tandy Cyrus. And here you can see a photograph of Tandy and her two boys. So at this stage, at this very early stage, uh, when Nancy's phoning up the police dispatcher, Garrett Phillips is in hospital emergency and is being treated. Uh, members of his family are around and near him. Now, Tandy Cyrus, when she finds out about what's happened to Garrett, she calls her ex-boyfriend, John Jones, at 6.08 p.m. Unfortunately and tragically, uh, Garrett Phillips was pronounced dead at 7.18 p.m. He was just 12 years old. So this is indeed a horrible tragedy. Um, the cause of death was by strangulation and suffocation. Now, what the coroner found was that Garrett had rug burns on his legs. He had marks around his face and neck. And these were consistent with fingernails and he also had a black eye. It was ruled as a homicide. A young boy had lost his life. Now, I want to introduce Garrett's uncle, Brian Phillips. Now, a little bit of history here. Garrett's biological father, Robert Phillips Jr., he had died of a brain aneurysm when Garrett was just under three years of age. And Brian Phillips, of course, was Garrett's uncle. And he was more like a father figure to Garrett Phillips. I now want to introduce to you a very important person. And this is lead investigator, Mark Murray. He's from the Potsdam Police Department. Now, the police dispatcher phones Mark Murray at 5.53 p.m. to tell him, to inform him about uh, what Officer Wentworth found in apartment 4D. However, Mark Murray had missed the phone call from the police dispatcher at that particular time. Uh, it went to voicemail. And the reason why Mark Murray missed the call was he was actually coaching a soccer game at the local school. Mark Murray, upon hearing uh, his voicemail, he attends the crime scene. And of course, they're photographing um, all around the crime scene. And what they noticed was that in the third bedroom, the officers notice that the blinds on the window are bent outwards. And you can see that quite clearly in the diagram. So just to show you um, what the officers found, you can clearly see that someone had pushed out the blind uh, in the bedroom. And this is from a view from outside. You can see that not only is the blind bent, but the outside fly screen is also, has also been bent outwards. The investigators also discover that just down below from that window, uh, there's a tile on the surface of the ledge and it shows a substantial crack. So someone clearly has leapt from the second floor window onto this particular ledge. And on the ground, in the grass, they observe a divot. So someone has jumped from the ledge onto the grass and left an impression, uh, likely from their feet. So in summary, this is how the killer escaped from the apartment. So you can see that the killer 
of Garrett Phillips leapt from the window, jumped on this particular ledge. He cracked a tile, presumably it was a male, cracked a tile and leapt onto the grass and ran away. There's one huge problem. No one saw this event take place. No one visually saw this happen. Now, investigator Gary Snell, on the same day, he visits Garrett's father's family. Now, Gary Snell is from New York State Police. Now, you've got to remember that this is a fairly tight-knit community. Uh, most people know each other. So Gary Snell goes and visits Garrett's father's family and he interviews them. And very interestingly, uh, Garrett's father's family mentions Aurel Hillary as a potential person of interest. Well, they got the name wrong. The actual name of the individual is Oral Nick Hillary. Uh, he also happened to be an ex-boyfriend of Tan Cyrus. So it is important at this stage to have a look at who Nick Hillary actually was. Well, Nick Hillary was a well-known person and very well liked in the community. He was born a Jamaican and he immigrated at the age of 16. He had a spotless record. He was also a military veteran, having served uh, the United States for three years. He was an active member of the community. He was a star athlete. He had a promising career as a soccer coach. He was a maths teacher, and he also was a university graduate. Uh, one of his best friends was Mani Tafari, who was a former teammate. They used to play soccer together, and Mani uh, happened to be an attorney. His other good friend was Ian Fairley, uh, and Ian was an assistant soccer coach at Clarkson University. And you'll see that both Marnie and Ian are going to be two very important people in the unfolding of this story. So let's have a look at some more history because it is very important. Nick Hillary met Tandy Cyrus in 2010, and both uh, Tandy and Nick shared many common interests together. Now, being of uh, Nick's ethnicity, the couple was easily noticed within the community. Now, Tandy had worked as a bartender at Ton's Bar at night time, and she was a banker uh, during the day. Now this is important because the soccer coaches used to hang out um, in the evening at Ton's bar to discuss um, how the games went uh, and other uh, chatter. Now Tandy was also a soccer player and she was very athletic. And the two formed a, a bond, a relationship. Now it's important now to consider the history between Nick Hillary, Tandy Cyrus, and Sheriff's Deputy John Jones. Now, Nick was a student at St. Lawrence, and then a men's soccer coach at Clarkson. John and Nick were friends prior to Nick dating Tandy. John was dating and living with Tandy prior to Nick socializing with Tandy. Now, it just so happened that John saw Nick and Tandy drive by together. John had confronted Nick at his residence. Now, Nick, at the time, was living with his partner, Stasia, and his children. And John was threatening to Nick. And I'll discuss more about this later. John texted Tandy and said, this is it. John's relationship with Tandy broke down. Now, John told Stasia about Nick and Tandy, and this resulted in several domestic incidences, and we'll discuss about those later. Now, after this all occurred, 
Nick was now dating Tandy, Sheriff's Deputy Jones' ex-girlfriend. Now, Tandy Cyrus, who had two children at the time, and Nick Hillary, he had three children at the time, but his daughter goes with Nick to live with him. All of them eventually moved together in a house. So let's get back to the investigation. Now, Mark Murray phones up Nick Hillary at home at 9.42. Now, this is two and a half hours after Garrett's death. Mark Murray asked Nick Hillary to come down to the police station. Unfortunately, Nick Hillary at the time was looking after his children. So Nick Hillary at 9.45 p.m. rings Mark Murray back and states to him, uh, is it possible that you could come down to my house and speak to me? So Mark Murray, he goes and visits a Nick Hillary with Gary Snell uh, and they inform him they inform Nick Hillary that Garrett Phillips had passed away and no reasons were given at all and uh, as you can see from the notes written by um, Mark Murray I quote I feel so empty inside oh my god and Mark Murray states seemed upset so this has come straight out of the blue uh, when Nick Hillary hears the news. And what's bizarre here, and the question is, was it usual to inform an ex-boyfriend of the death of a child? So Nick Hillary has no idea how Garrett Phillips had passed away. So now we go to Tuesday, October the 25th, 2011. This is one day after the death of Garrett Phillips. At 7.32 a.m. in the morning, Dan Manor, who's the district attorney investigator, phones up Mark Murray to find out what's going on. Mark Murray states in a phone call conversation, I quote, cut off the heads of any accusations that some kids were with him, obviously referring to Garrett Phillips. This is some 12 hours after Garrett's death. And it's interesting that uh, Mark Murray says, there's one person in particular that we want to talk to. Now this is 12 hours after Garrett's death. So it's very interesting that other possible leads were being immediately cut off. And the question has to be asked, why is that the case? So Tandy Cyrus, is interviewed uh, and this occurs on October the 25th the day after so I quote at 8 30 a.m. Garrett's mother Tandy Cyrus arrives at the police station for the first of many interviews and note John Jones uh, her ex-boyfriend is sitting right next to her in the interview room now just to get uh, a bit of the story going here. Tandy stated that she had phoned Garrett at 4:30 to go home to uh, to go home from school and do his homework. And John Jones tells his girlfriend that he's going to stay with Tandy. This is obviously um, on the evening uh, when uh, they were all at the hospital. So John Jones had his own girlfriend at the stage. And uh, he phoned her and he said that he was going to stay with Tandy. So in the interview room with the investigators, you've got an ex-boyfriend, John Jones, holding hands with Tandy and sitting right next to her. Now, Mark Murray writes down a lot of very important questions. Uh, he says, and these are all very good questions. Who has keys? Wallet contents on floor next to bed. What are they doing there? Leave bra on a floor because when the investigators um, went inside the bedroom, um, a bra was found on the floor. Uh, why was there mail on the nightstand? 
Has Hillary been in an apartment not supposed to be? Does he have key? Was Garrett supposed to be home or at school? And then they said, um, speak to landlord Rick. Change locks when Tandy moved in. Now, what is interesting here, of course, is that John Jones is sitting in the interview room. So John Jones was obviously aware of what questions were being asked by the investigators and where the investigation was heading to. And Mark Murray makes the comment, a quote, looking like a homicide. Now, I said to you before uh, that Nick Hillary uh, and his daughter and Tandy Cyrus with her two children, they all moved together in a house. Unfortunately, that setup was not working and Nick and Tandy eventually separate. And I quote, this is what Tandy said, because Tandy was obviously questioned about why they had separated. I quote, one of the kids made a comment because I was dating a black man. And Tandy also said, we decided to try to work things out. We were going to live in separate places because we were living in the same house over on Spring Street. Now, there was no doubt that there was some tension between Garrett Phillips and Nick Hillary. Now, Nick Hillary was a disciplinarian, right? He wanted to make sure uh, that, the, that the boys of uh, Tandy grew up with respect and he was a tight disciplinarian. Now, the important point was this, even though uh, Tandy and Nick separated, they were actually still seeing each other and it was an amical separation. In the meantime, John Jones finds an apartment for Tandy Cyrus after the two had separated. And the apartment that John Jones found was at 100 Market Street. This was the place where the murder took place. Now, the apartment just happened to be close to where John Jones lived, and he stated, it was a convenience for the boys and not for being close to me. So now, Tandy Cyrus and her two boys uh, moved in to 100 Market Street in apartment 4D. Uh, this apartment was found by her ex-boyfriend, John Jones. Now, Nick Hillary, on hearing the news about Garrett Phillips, he actually phoned Tandy Cyrus, but she never responded back. And Nick Hillary also phoned her family members as well to find out what was going on. And uh, Tandy Cyrus did not respond back. And this call uh, was captured, of course, on her voicemail. And it's pretty clear what the um, thinking was at that stage. And I quote Major Smith, we got to lock somebody up. So John Jones made the comment, no doubt in my mind he did it. And of course, he's referring to Nick Hillary. And what was very interesting was this comment that the law enforcement officers had told John Jones, Nick's the guy. Now, it doesn't take too long before Nick Hillary becomes a person of interest. And of course, Tandy Cyrus uh, writes a report, uh, a statement, and part of that statement is as follows, and I quote, I have replayed everything in my mind a million times. When I put everything together, thinking about Nick's actions before and after. I think he was very possessive and controlling. When we broke up, Nick told me my kids were making my decisions for me. He told my parents that too. He told Paddy Phillips that too. Nick always blamed Garrett for our breakup. He never blamed Aaron because Aaron was younger and just followed Garrett's lead. Note the following. I can't think of any other person who would want to hurt Garrett. Now, was this brilliant investigative work or the start of tunnel vision? So, 
at 11.49 a.m. Ed Tischler, remember, he's the chief of Potland's de uh, police department. He phones up Rick Smith, who's the major of New York State Police, and he thanks him for all the hard work that the officers are doing. Now, this is 16 hours after Garrett's death. And Chief Tischler makes the comment, we have a strong suspect at this point. He also makes the comment, and we're just trying to get all the ammunition against him at this point. Now, this is before um, any forensic evidence has been tested, nothing. He's making this comment, and I'll quote again, and we're just trying to get all the ammunition against him at this point. Clearly, they're looking at only one person at this stage for the murder of Garrett Phillips. Now, of course, the neighbours are questioned. And you can see here that uh, Shannon Harris uh, heard a screen ripping. And that's obviously the screen from the window. Now, you can see here in the circle uh, where uh, Andrew's car was when they were changing the tyre. They had a perfect vantage point of the apartment and the window. Now, this is an important and critical point. Shannon and Andrew left this particular area at 5.20 p.m. They did not see anyone escape from the window. Now, why are these time points so critical? because they're on their mobile phones and they were checking texts and messages. So they know they had particular timestamps. So they knew what time they arrived at that spot and what time they had left. Now, it's pretty obvious at this stage that they're suspecting Nick Hillary. So Nick Hillary was actually observed at a soccer game by Mark Murray. He clearly was under police surveillance. So Mark Murray went to a soccer game on October the 25th with a video camera. And he states in a report, he displayed a significant limp on his right leg. Now, why is this significant? Well, if the attacker had jumped out of the second floor window and eventually landed on the grass below, um, he may have injured himself because it's actually quite a height from the window to the ground. So, Nick Hillary is being videotaped and is under surveillance. Unfortunately, many years later, when the police video was actually subpoenaed, it clearly showed that Nick Hillary did not have a limp. And this was commented by both uh, Lisa and Manny who are both friends and attorneys uh, of Nick. And you can see here a still um, from the police video that was taken one day after the murder. Uh, and this particular uh, police video was released years later. But remember, in Mark Murray's report, he had stated that uh, Nick Hillary had a significant limp. Well, if you ever watched the documentary, you can clearly see that uh, Nick Murray is doing anything but having a limp and he's walking freely. And what is disturbing here is that Mark Murray got caught out in a lie. And the question has to be asked, why did he do this? And I think the answer is pretty obvious. So on Wednesday, the 26th of October, 2011, Nick Hillary is called to come in. So both Mark Murray and Gary Snell, they tell Nick Hillary that the purpose of the meeting was to go over the student roster of Garrett's class. And they, were, and they asked Nick Hillary to come down to the Potsdam Police Department. And again, the reason for doing this was to quote, to go over the student roster of Garrett's class. Nick Hillary saw no issues with this and he agrees to attend the meeting. So what I'm going to do now, and this is very important, is I'm going to go through a couple of stills from the interview. 
I like to call it an interrogation. Now, you've got Nick Hillary here, you've got Gary Snell, and you've got Mark Murray. And they've got a video camera inside the um, room. Everything is being recorded. So um, the interview uh, commences at 8.28 a.m. in the morning. And I'll read some of the quotes. Snell, why don't you just advise him of his information, his rights, and all that? This immediately is a red flag. They're not talking about the class roster at all. And uh, the investigators are talking about uh, his rights. That's a red flag. Another red flag is the following. This is from Snell. I mean, she's a good looking girl, obviously, and draws attention. You know what I mean? And this red flag as well. I quote, did you break up with her or did she break up with you? Or what's the deal with how that happened? That's another huge red flag. And you got to remember that the, inter uh, that the interrogators, they'd already spoken to Tandy the day before. Now, Mark Murray says to him, you're not under arrest. Here's another red flag. Snell, I quote, everybody's a suspect to us. This whole town's a suspect, okay? All these kids are. And quite clearly, Gary Snell was directly lying to Nick. And you could see the way that Gary was sitting in his chair, legs apart, arms behind his head. This is a very aggressive stance. And you can see that um, Nick Hillary was sitting in the middle between the two investigators. I quote, Hillary says, all right, you just read me my Miranda rights and I'm going to implement my sixth amendment. That's pretty obvious that Nick knew exactly what the investigators were up to. So importantly, Nick Murray had the nous to say, uh, Nick Hillary, my apologies, had the nous to say, I'm going to implement my sixth amendment. Some more steals from the interview. Murray, I don't think you went there with any intentions to harm him. So as you can see, they're starting to apply the re-technique uh, on Nick. Hillary, went where? Murray, I don't think you did. Snell, Nick, Nick, it's a 12 year old. Accidents happened. Snell, I know what happened there, okay? These are all huge red flags. And Nick was definitely aware of what the investigators were trying to do. Snell, aren't you curious as to what Gareth said or anything in his dying moments? Wouldn't that make you curious? So it's pretty obvious that the investigators are lying to Nick at this stage and they're hitting him with the line. Uh, aren't you curious uh, to what Garrett said or anything in his dying moments? Wouldn't that make you curious? And of course, these are massive red flags and this is your standard re-technique 101. And of course, the reasons for doing this was that the investigators were hoping for Nick to confess at this stage and to admit his guilt in the murder of Garrett Phillip. Snell, he's a kid who sits in the way of your relationship. So quite clearly, the investigators are trying to come up with a motive for why a Nick would want to kill Garrett Phillips. And they're honing in on the fact that there was tension between Garrett and Nick, and that that had affected his relationship with Tandy. Hillary, listen to what you're saying to me, Gary. Hillary, you said you knew. You said you have a full idea of what has gone on there. And Hillary states, why am I here then, if you know? So the incredible thing, is that Nick maintains his composure while under intense questioning. And why shouldn't he? 
If he hadn't committed any crime, why shouldn't he uh, maintain his composure? Now, Murray states, there's a dead 12-year-old kid and you're telling me you won't tell me when your practice was on or was on? So Nick Murray, sorry, Nick Hillary gets up and is free to leave. And of course, look what happens. Snell immediately gets up and starts moving towards the door. Snell, you're going, you're going to be held here, down here for a minute anyways. Hillary, Gary, please, Snell. Well, I'm telling you right now, listen to me, Snell. But in the meantime, we're going to apply for a search warrant to get permission to photograph your body. And if you have a look, Snell, is his back is right towards the door. It's clear they don't want Nick to leave and they're desperate to get a search warrant. Snell, you said you want to be helpful. Put your phone down, shut it off and be helpful with me, okay? It's pretty clear that Nick is extremely concerned at this stage and he phones his friend um, Marnie. So throughout the interview, when um, Nick is told that he's free to leave, Gary Snell blocks the door and prevents Nick from leaving the room. Now Nick knows that if he tries to move out, if he touches Gary Snell, he's going to be arrested. So unfortunately for Nick, he's got no choice but to stay in that room. I quote Ames. Because we're going to end up taking it, so you're done with the phone calls. You talk to your lawyer, everything's good. We need your phone. So in addition to calling Mani Tafari, who was his friend and is an attorney, he goes on a seven hour drive from New York City to arrive to Potsdam. Nick Hillary also calls a local lawyer James Garland. Nick hands over his mobile phone. Also on that day, they impound Nick's vehicle. Now, they write up a search warrant uh, in order to uh, photograph Nick Hillary's body. And I'm going to read this out. So this is the search warrant. Two, the Potsdam Police Department and the New York State Police or any police officer employed or having general jurisdiction to act as a police officer in the county of St. Lawrence, New York. You are hereby directed to conduct a search of the person of Oral N. Hillary, who is currently located at the Potsdam Police Department, 38 Main Street, Potsdam, New York, including but not limited to the clothing currently worn by Oral N. Hillary, which includes a pair of green colored sweatpants, the contents of the pockets, including but not limited to the cigarette butt wrapped in a piece of paper, a hooded maroon colored sweatshirt, a digital wristwatch, a pair of white colored socks, and a pair of white colored sneakers. Fingerprints, including fingerprints and palm prints to be taken, photographs of his person and any evidence seized for the following designated property or kinds of property for the purpose of seizing same. Any evidence of struggle, including but not limited to abrasions, scrapes, scratches, bruises, or injury, which would be consistent with injury sustained during the homicide of Garrett J. Phillips or the exit from the homicide scene thereof. Any physical or trace evidence that connects Oral N. Hillary with the victim Garrett J. Phillips. You are directed to execute this warrant between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. Okay, so now they have got permission, they've got a search warrant to photograph Murray. And Murray states, set the search warrant start time 
at 16.01. Today's date, October 26, 2011. Now I'm going to show you some photography stills that they took of uh, Nick Hillary. So as you can see, they take photographs of him and they ask him to remove his clothing, the photograph his hands, and all of Nick's clothing, including his shoes, were removed and kept as evidence. Uh, they photograph all parts of his body, including his feet, and then you've got the gotcha moment, according to uh, Mark Murray. And uh, Nick Hillary contained or had a small ankle wound, uh, and you can clearly see that he had no dressing over it, no bandages, nothing, and that the wound had already scabbed over. Now, why is this important? Because the perpetrator, the killer of Garrett Phillips, had jumped from the second floor window. So Mark Murray had associated this small ankle wound to the murder of Garrett Phillips by Nick Hillary. They also took his underwear, the necklace that he was wearing. Uh, they photographed him naked. And as you can see here, they even photographed his genitals. So Nick Hillary was strip searched totally naked uh, and extensively photographed, including his genitals. So as you can see, they photographed his neck, his face. They were looking for any obvious signs of a struggle. Now, what is remarkable? After taking all of Nick Hillary's clothing, shoes, socks, they give him a paper hazmat suit. He's now released. So after eight hours of interrogation, Nick is released from uh, the interview room. He's not arrested and he has to go home dressed in a hazmat suit. He doesn't have a car, nothing. Now, at the same time, uh, his friend, Ian Fairley, is interviewed at the police station as well. And what is interesting here is that he states uh, uh, in, in the report, I quote, Nick stopped, by my, Nick stopped by my apartment between 5 and 5.15. And this is Ian Fairley, um, uh, Nick's friend, who was an assistant coach at the time. So why is this important? Well, the reason why this is important is that Nick Hillary cannot be in two places at the same time. And the timestamp of 521 is solid because this was confirmed by a phone call with a timestamp. So uh, Fairley had seen Nick Hillary uh, in his house at 521. So you can see here on the right hand side uh, where the crime scene was and where Nick Farley's house was. So uh, Ian stated that he saw Nick Hillary at 521 at his house. So why is this important? This is why it's important. Because if you remember, Officer Wentworth heard movement in apartment 4D at 5.24. The sound was faint, but it was if a single person was walking around in the apartment. So as you can see here, no one was seen jumping out of the window from 4.50 to 5.20. So this presented a huge problem for the investigators who were trying to implicate Nick in the murder of Garrett Phillips. Now, the investigators knew the importance of Ian Fairley's um, deposition. Ian, of course, was Nick's uh, alibi. And um, years later, Ian Fairley wrote an affidavit. And I'm going to read this because it is very important. A quote, I, Ian Fairley, being duly sworn, deposes and says, 
On October 24, 2011, at about 8 p.m., I was at Oral, Nick Hillary's apartment, when police officers called Mr. Hillary on his cell phone and requested that he go to the station. Mr. Hillary responded that he could not at the time as he had to supervise his children. Later that night, three police officers arrived at Mr. Hillary's apartment and spoke to him for 20 minutes. On October 25th, 2011, I was at Clarkson University when I was called into Kelly Norman's office where investigators Pete and another police officer questioned me about Mr. Hillary. I was asked specifically what I knew about Mr. Hillary's relationship with Garrett Phillips. On Wednesday, October 26, 2011, I was called and asked to come to the Potsdam Police Station. Once I arrived, Investigator Pete and another police officer took me to what appeared to be an interrogation room. I was asked, uh, I was asked me about my activities from Monday afternoon, October 24, 2011 onwards. I was also asked to write a statement regarding those activities, which I did. The next day, Thursday, October 27th, I was asked again to come to the Potsdam Police Station, and I did. I was told by the officers that the district attorney was upstairs and was prepared to write an obstruction of justice charge for my arrest. Investigator Peets then said to me, I quote, we fucking know Nick did it. We know he did it. Don't stand up for this guy. You don't owe him anything. Unquote. Investigator Peets further stated that while in the ambulance, Garrett Phillips briefly regained consciousness and said, Nick. Investigator Peets then went upstairs to see if they would hold me. He came back to the interrogation room and said, you won't be charged. After about one or two weeks, Officer Murray and another police officer came to my home to further question me about Mr. Hillary in relation to the death of Garrett Phillips. I was told by the police officer Snell that if I changed my statement from October 26, 2011, I would not get in trouble. At some point later, Lieutenant Mark Murray and Officer Snell came to my home and showed me a video of Mr. Hillary in a car and asked how this affects me. In April 2012, I was asked once again to come to the Potsdam Police Department. Again, I was asked about Mr. Hillary with regards to Garrett Phillips. I was accompanied by my attorney, on this occasion. I swear or affirm that the above and foregoing representations are true and correct to the best of my information, knowledge and belief. It's pretty clear that the investigators were intimidating Nick's alibi. Alright, thank you so much guys. This is the end of part one. I'm Dr. Silkman from the Foul Play team. Please join me soon for the conclusion of this tragic case. The tragic death of Garrick Phillips, a cry for justice. Thank you very much.